Welcome to the second legislative forum in a series of three being sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Johnson County during the 2020 Iowa legislative session. Out of courtesy for all present, we ask that you silence your cell phones now. I am Jean Bancroft and I'm a member of the League of Women Voters of Johnson County. The League is dedicated to educating voters on political and ballot issues. We encourage informed citizen participation in the government. Membership is open to both men and women, age 16 and older. We invite you to join us. There are brochures about the League on the table in the lobby. These forums are designed to give local citizens an opportunity to discuss current state legislative issues with their elected officials while the legislative session is underway. Today's forum focuses on issues related to the environment. Co-sponsors for today are 100 Grannies, CAFE, which is Clean Air for Everyone, the Iowa City Area Group of the Sierra Club, and the Iowa City Climate Activists. Now I'd like to introduce our legislators. First, the senators, Senator Joe Bolcom from District 43, Kevin Kinney from District 39, Zach Walls from District 37 is unable to be with us today. The representatives next, Mary Masher, District 86. Morning. Vicki Lensing, District 85. Dave Jacoby, District 74. Bob Kaufman, District 73. Amy Nielsen, District 77. We'll start the forum with five minute summaries from each of our legislators on recent legislative matters of interest to them individually, starting with <coughs> Senator Bolcom representing District 43. Good morning. Good morning, Jean. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. It's a beautiful morning, isn't it? Sunny. <coughs> it's going to be warm today. It's good to be here. Um, we uh, are in our sixth week of the legislative session. It's good to see Representative Kaufman here from our eastern neighbor, Cedar County. Um, we're in a sixth week of the session. This week was the first funnel week, which means a bill, most bills had to get out of a committee this week to be alive for the most part, with the exception of uh, tax policy bills and expenditure bills. Um, so there, there were a lot of things that, uh, there were a bunch of stuff that made it and a bunch of stuff that didn't. Uh, and opinions vary on, on what was good and what was bad. One of the major bills that uh, I'm interested in and spent a bunch of time on is uh, the governor's so-called Invest in Iowa uh, proposal, which is an enormous tax proposal uh, that's before the General Assembly. The governor, uh, like a lot of governors, they propose things that don't necessarily become law, but they be begin to frame issues. And uh, this proposal has several elements to it, really four major elements. One is increasing the sales tax by one penny, it would go up to 7% uh, statewide plus the local option that's available in I think probably 97 of 99 counties. Uh, one penny raises about $540 million, so think about that. And the proposal then says we'll reduce income taxes by about $410 million and we'll reduce local property taxes that are the backbone of our mental health system by about $80 million. So that people that would vote for that, because part of the half of the team over in Des Moines doesn't really like to raise taxes. Well, nobody really likes to raise taxes, but Republicans generally are pretty reluctant to do that. They want to be able to say, we didn't really raise taxes, even though we raised the sales tax a penny, which you'll see every time you buy a six pack of beer or uh, many other things. But, but you got, we gave you an income tax cut. <coughs> And basically, um, they're even, so we don't have any new revenue. Uh, at the same time, the state says uh, we have to fund our, in, our uh, environmental trust fund, which we passed in 2010, at three-eighths of a cent. So three-eighths of that one penny is allegedly supposed to go to fund environmental programs, uh, soil conservation, outdoor recreation. And in that part of the plan, her plan, she takes about that three-eighths raises, say, $180 million. She takes a little bit more than half of it and applies it to things we're already funding. And so it has only about half the benefit that advocates had hoped for to fund all these things, like in town, like improving our city parks, improving bike trails, those kinds of things. 
are also received last because she proposes to change the formula and take money that would go to towns and cities to do more outdoor rec and moves the money to the countryside, uh, private landowners, so they can take better care of their land. So that's the second part. The third part is a proposal to reduce what's really been the most stable support of our county mental health system. She proposes a 70% reduction in the local money that's raised through our property taxes to fund our, our mental health system. And she says, we'll pay for that with state money. The problem with that is um, this, this local money has really been the stable force behind creating what we have for our mental health system over the last 50 years. It's overseen by local people, it's controlled by local people, and it, it's accountable for results because there's local people paying attention to how the money's spent. She would undermine, I think, our mental health system with this proposal. So that's three things. The fourth thing is that she eliminates the so-called triggers that are in the current law that we passed in 2017. To remind you, in 2017, the leg legislature passed an enormous income tax cut that's being phased in right now. About $500 million a year has been lost in income taxes. Nearly half of that went to less than 3% of the taxpayers. So it was really weighted to people that, have, that are wealthy, okay? She proposes to get rid of a trigger uh, about some additional tax cuts that are already on the books. And the trigger is a 4% revenue growth in state budget. We're not gonna ever get that. People, real, the business people, and they realize that. So she gets rid of that. And that gives up somewhere between 300 and 400 million more dollars in state revenue starting in 2023. So we're taking on new mental health expenses, new environmental expenses, we're essentially not really raising any new money with the sales tax, because as I say, in this first bite, it raised 540, it goes down, and then there's this next wallop of a tax cut coming. So when the governor says her proposal, she's on the road this week in seven different communities selling her Invest in Iowa plan, I don't, I, the, 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 the advertising doesn't meet the details. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Senator Kinney. Hi, I'm uh, Kevin Kinney. I serve uh, Senate District 39, which is uh, Western and Southern Johnson, Washington, and uh, Keokuk County. Uh, the, it's been a, a very busy week this uh, last week with uh, Funnel Week being here. I think I've had 20, 24 subcommittees uh, this week. So we were going from meeting to meeting from 7 o'clock in the morning, and I wasn't leaving the Capitol until 7.30 at night. Um, a couple of the things that uh, I'm, I'm on the transportation uh, committee and one of the things that's going forward uh, is the uh, Senate file 2248 expanding uh, expanding the hands-free driving uh, it uh, I think that overall that uh, that is going to be a plus and uh, and I continue to hope that that goes forward also another thing that came out of the transportation uh, committee was a uh, Senate file 20 2809 and it's a lifetime ban on commercial driver's licenses for people that have been convicted of human trafficking if, if they've used uh, that commercial driver's license in in a way in which someone has trafficked uh, something that uh, an another thing that uh, that it has, has died at this point is the uh, bill dealing with out-of-state uh, companies coming in and raising rents along with other uh, practices in our mobile home community uh, i'm hoping that uh, senator or representative kaufman uh, will take the bill that that the senate passed last year and will able be able to keep that bill alive in which will we're going to be able to address uh, some of those things where people people that live in apartments uh, will have at least people that live in apartments have more rights than the people that live in trailer courts and that own their trailer but rent the parcel of ground that it sits on and uh, i'm hoping that that uh, will continue to move forward uh house file 2434 uh, making ems an essential service and i'm sure i'll let uh, representative kaufman speak in this it seems like 
there's kind of a theme here. Him and I have been working on a lot of these bills uh, together, uh, and it's allowing uh, counties to designate that uh, EMS is an essential service and should be funded, and uh, uh, that's something that, that I would also like to see go forward. One of the things that came up in judiciary on Wednesday, uh, since I worked on the, the hemp legislation, I thought it would probably come through agriculture, but it wound up coming through judiciary, in which I sit on judiciary, so I was able to uh, sit on <coughs> in on the subcommittee, and that's the uh, uh, allowing CBDs that is derived from hemp, which is under the 0.03% level, to be used in uh, additives, uh, supplements, uh, at your GNCs and so forth. Uh, uh, Senator Schneider, uh, the president of the Senate, is the one that's actually pushing this bill. It has more to deal with the processing, so forth, of it than the growing. We've been working on the growing the last few years. This is really the first step on the processing side of it. <coughs> um, another bill that was in the ag is uh, protecting veterinarians who report animal abuse. Uh, there's a duty right now that a client patient privilege that exists that a veterinarian really can't report a person that's abusing their animals. This gives them the ability to be able to report that abuse uh, without uh, having civil uh, effects to them. Uh, I, I look forward to hearing your questions and, and uh, Hopefully, I can learn something today. Thank you, Senator Kinney. Uh, Representative Masher. Thank you, and good morning to everyone. Thank you for being here today. I'm glad we have a packed house. That's exciting, and, and uh, I want to thank the TV audience as well for tuning in. Uh, the League, thank you so much, Gene, for being our moderator today, and the League for all of your activities regarding the 19th Amendment and commemorating that. I know that you've had activities throughout the county for the whole year, and um, if you don't have a copy of that, I think it's on the table out here. Um, they are doing some amazing things to help uh, people understand why that right to vote was so important and how everybody didn't get it when that 19th Amendment was adopted. So educating us all about that is really important. We did do a resolution on the floor uh, this last month, and again, we've done our part in terms of recognizing that as well. They had a big kickoff event in Ames uh, last week, and I think it was well attended and well received. Um, I wanted to thank the sponsors this morning. I know we're talking about environmental issues, and I want to touch on some of those um, before we uh, finish this morning, but I'm looking forward to their questions as well. Um, I also wanted just to mention during this last month, we lost two really, really important Democrats, uh, Jeff Cox and Tom Jacobs. And Tom was a labor leader. Jeff was a professor at the university for many years. And they will be sorely missed in terms of their activities and what they contributed to our county. I think uh, we need to take a minute and just think about the fact that those folks had it made a difference. And I think it's important for us to recognize that. Uh, I did want to mention a choir concert. Some of us went last night to uh, the choir concert that they had regarding Bayard Rustin. And he was the one that organized the March on Washington when Dr. King gave his I Have a Dream speech. And he's the one that was kind of the nuts and bolts behind that whole march without cell phones or internet, <laughs> if you can imagine. So um, they did the concert last night. Uh, we had our mayor, Teague, uh, had solo parts in it. There is one more performance, which is why I'm mentioning it. They're going to do it again next Saturday, February 29th in Cedar Rapids at the People's Church Unitarian Universalist, and that's on Gordon Avenue in Cedar Rapids. So if you didn't get to see it last night, you have another opportunity. So the bills that I've been working on that are really important are EMS, um, I know Representative Kaufman's going to talk about that, but EMS services are not identified as essential services in Iowa. So we don't have a dedicated source of funding. And the comment is, where you live should not determine if you live. 
and that's what's happening in our rural areas. So making sure that we have those services available to all Iowans and that we have a dedicated source of funding for it is extremely important. We've passed bills in state government. We're working on the funding mechanism as well. And that, I think, is extremely important to a lot of Iowans. The other bill that I wanted to mention was the bottle bill. Um, we passed through state government this week um, in the opposition to a many, a, a many grocers around the state, but we felt like we needed to keep the issue alive, and we want to get to the point where we're talking about the next generation of what the bottle bill should look like. And Representative Lensing has worked on that for many, many years. Representative Kaufman allowed that to come through our state government committee. What we're hoping is to lock all of the stakeholders in a room, give them no food or water, <laughs> and tell them you cannot go to the restroom, you cannot go anywhere until we get an agreement. So and we're going to make them caucus is that's what you're exactly saying? Right. Okay. <laughs> Ooh. I'm in a feisty mood today, Mary. I'm sorry. Oh well, as long as we see the results. <laughs> oh. <laughs> anyway, I'm not touching either of those. <laughs> but that's what we're going to do to try to get an agreement because I think there is a middle ground and it's time. We just need to get to the point where we are doing a better job. It's been 30 years that that bill's been in place and we haven't made the improvements needed. So let's get it done and let's work on that because it's extremely important. Oh, Eleanor, only a minute. Did, uh, Dave and Amy kind of interrupted there. Oh, Wait a yeah, minute. Yeah. I, I get Please a little more my, just because of that. Yes. Okay, the last one is the education <laughs> bill on classroom management and student behavior. We've been working on that in the education committee. Um, I want to make sure people understand that this is really not an intensive program. It's a pilot program. It's $1.6 million. It's a grant program through the Department of Ed. It's 1.6 for the actual therapeutic classrooms where students would be placed if they have disruptive behaviors and 500,000 for transporting them to those classrooms. So it will only affect at most 150 kids out of half a million kids in Iowa and probably a large number that need the help. Uh, if we would fund schools adequately, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in. We would have the teachers and the smaller class sizes, and we'd be able to have those frontline individuals, counselors, social workers, and school nurses that we need to be able to implement <coughs> and help those kids who are struggling. I'll stop then, Eleanor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, I'm Mary. I'm looking forward to your questions. <laughs> Representative Lensing. Thank you. Um, thank you to everyone who's here this morning. <coughs> That sun is very tempting to make us want to be someplace else. So thank you for spending this time with us. I serve on local government, environmental protection, state government, and oversight. Oversight did not meet. We, we are funnel proof, so if issues come up, we can meet later. In local government, we haven't done too much. Environmental protection, we haven't done much either. We did two bills this week. One was underground storage tanks where we moved the board and the funds to the Department of Natural Resources. And the other one was, I'm trying to think, I can't, I think it was about engineers and some responsibilities. Sadly, we don't do as much as, as I would like to see done in that committee. On the other hand, um, I'd like to pick up on state government where we did the bottle bill the bottle deposit bill. Uh, I have worked on that, I think, my entire career in the legislature. I'm not making many steps forward, but, you know, we, and I hate to say it, but we keep kicking the can down the road. Uh, and so this bill had a little bit more substance, and, and Mary talked about it, but I thought I'd give you a little bit more detail. So it, it would require the retailer to pay the penny handling fee to the distributor at delivery and we would increase that handling fee from one cent to two cents. Most of the time when I talk to constituents, they, they like the whole process so much. You know, I, I've had a lot of people say, you could go from a nickel to a dime, I'd be fine with it. I don't think on the other side, um, our, our retailers and distributors are as comfortable with that. Um, so for them to even go to two cents was kind of a big deal. They talk about putting a, a 10 mile radius around a retailer <laughs> and redemption center. Um, I was told by some in the lobby they'd rather see it at 15 miles, but there's not agreement on that. So 
it's still in in process I also we put some enforcement in the bill um, through the Attorney General but but I don't know if it's enough and I think there's a concern that when we pass bills we don't always have a mechanism then to make sure that they are working correctly so we I think we still need to work on that I will tell you grocery stores are not happy about this I, I had several talk to me in in un, no uncertain terms that they didn't like it which has always been the case uh, and I think they often feel that this has been forced upon them but you know you buy things there so it makes sense that you should be able to return things there they don't agree with that but uh, and I know that uh, in terms of recycling especially in the rural areas it's a little more difficult um, it's not like here where we have more places we can take it another place uh, another issue I think is if you sell it you should take the cans back and we have dollar stores and stores like that that will sell beverages in containers that they will not take back so I think we need to we do need to do something to make sure that if you sell it you do have to take it back I think it's a work in progress I think we still need to get you know Mary mentioned putting everybody in a room and locking the door I would hope that there is someone left at the end of that meeting <laughs> because it is very um, it is very controversial among folks so, so something that we take for granted is something that we do the people that have to make it all work are not happy with the way it's going so I I hope that we do continue as as the session continues on towards an end and we do get something positive out of that I I know your focus is on the environment this week so I think I've told you all I know about mm -hmm. it but certainly if you have other questions about that I look forward to it and thank you all for being here this morning thank you Vicki representative Jacoby thank you and thank you the League of Women Voters and the sponsors today for hosting in the city of Coralville for using this spot and I think if we could behind that window right behind Mike Carberry is John Hines who runs the uh, video part for the city of Coralville could we give him a quick round of applause for being here? Thank you, John, and feel free to airbrush any hair on me. <laughs> Being there. Uh, there's been a number of things we're working on. I am uh, uh, the ranking member on Ways and Means in the House, so we too are reviewing the governor's proposed Invest in Iowa bill. As just a reminder, there's three major sections. That is taxes, mental health, and I will. The bill has 87 separate sections. Any one of those sections is normally what we pass for a bill in either of the chambers. So it's quite the ominous, omnibus bill. There's some very good pieces and some egregious pieces in, in my viewpoint. But uh, on a positive note, my black bear bill has reached the floor of the house. That's both to protect black bears and protect the integrity of hunting. Uh, I will say that now that it reached the floor, it is my favorite constituents bill, Lynette. So uh, she, had, she said twice, have you filed the bill yet? Yes, dear, I filed the bill. <laughs> and she tracks all that. Uh, one thing that concerns me a little bit, it's not on the big picture of the Invest in Iowa bill, but we did a smaller bill that seems to be aimed at eliminating rest areas along the interstate or government-sponsored rest areas. Now, when you reach a certain age, those those rest areas are pretty darn important and, and I'm glad when I can make it all the way to Des Moines but sometimes I don't so whoa uh, well yeah, too much information I know yeah. <laughs> let me go through my midlife crisis my way but, but uh, yeah, I think it's real important that we keep those open and also have access for people who need services along our primary roadways uh, the manufacturing bill did stall a bit in the House, but I have had uh, conversations <coughs> with Representative Height, uh, the Republican from Pella, Pella area. He's also on the Ways and Means uh, with us, and he is interested in keeping that bill alive and finding a different venue. So all of us here at the table are working hard on that bill. Uh, on a negative or a very concerning note, uh, this week it was discovered that the governor through the old office of management now I don't remember the acronym gave a contract to workday technologies at 20 million dollars without any RFP or any process to have any competition to provide those tech services to HRs across the state of Iowa 
It's a $20 million contract plus $4 million a year for maintenance plus an extra in staffing costs. <clears throat> it doesn't sound like an MCO deal, but it really concerns me that something this large was given to a company from Texas who has a very short history of providing HR services to entities, cities, counties, and statewide, and it was done without any process to award that contract. Now, it's kind of funny for people from city and county government, we make sure that you don't do a darn thing over $50,000 without going through a complete process, but for some reason, the administration can do it for $20 million without any RFP, so I think it's important that we keep an eye on this as it comes through. I know uh, the media uh, is working on uncovering some other piece of this, but keep your <coughs> eyes open for news on the no-bid contract awarded. Thank you, Dave. Representative Kaufman. Good morning, everyone. Glad to be here. Um, the state government committee is extremely well represented uh, for Johnson County. <laughs> I, I chair the committee. Representative Nielsen uh, serves on the committee. Representative Lensing serves on the committee. And Representative Masher is the ranking member. So we are one of the busiest committees in the Capitol. I'm proud of that. And I think we've done a lot of good work. Uh, Joe, thank you for mentioning me in your opening comments. It seems almost accurate that you would miss me if I wasn't here. Is that true? <laughs> okay, there we go. Before this one, I did miss you. <laughs> um, Get a room. <laughs> <laughs> We're all feeling a little feisty this morning, if you hadn't noticed. Um, one thing I always like to start off forums with is I want to make it clear that Des Moines isn't Washington, D.C. In the last year of the legislative session, the last two-year term, we had 210 bills passed the Iowa legislature that became law. 92% of them had bipartisan support. In our state government committee, we have passed 32 bills this session. 29 of them have had bipartisan support. So we work together in Des Moines. There are times we disagree, um, and that's always going to be the case. But just for instance, in the last week during funnel week, we had 507 votes in state government. 400 and, I'm sorry, total votes, not like overall. So the overall vote count, 465 to 32 was our vote count last week. So we work together in state government. Some notable bills that have already been touched on, we did pass a version of the bottle bill with the attempts to force people to continue to work on that. One thing I'm surprised Representative Masher didn't mention is that we passed a, a really good election bill unanimously uh, that will expand voting rights, that will give more people an easier opportunity to vote. Uh, the fact that we have passed a pretty substantive election bill two years in a row unanimously, um, I think is a testament to our ability to work together. Um, one bill in judiciary that, that is, that is uh, something I'm running that's very interesting is a bill for the LGBTQ community. It's called the Gay Panic Defense Bill. In several other states, um, individuals have used and unfortunately successfully used a defense that if they were speaking to somebody, had a romantic interest, later discovered this person was not who they said they were, uh, they have successfully murdered them and used that as a defense to lessen their penalties. <clears throat> That's obviously abhorrent um, and disgusting and, and unacceptable. And so we are going to prohibit that in Iowa. But furthermore, I'm working with Representative Bennett, and we are going to have an amendment on the House floor that will expand that forbiddance of that defense to all major crimes, assaults, rapes, robberies, not just murder, so that nobody can use that as an excuse to harm somebody. Um, we continue to, pass, to work on our 411 bill. Uh, for our firefighters and our police officers, and that would expand uh, their retirement benefits, particularly in the work comp area. Uh, Representative Kinney and, and Masher and I have been working, excuse me, Senator Kinney, didn't mean to give you an, an upgrade, Kevin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna think I'm gonna walk out a different door afterwards now. Uh, but we are working to make EMS an essential service and give counties that option. And I am continuing to work on the mobile home bill as we do have a live round from a bill that passed the Senate, which is now sitting over in the House. One other thing that passed unanimously last week that I think is extremely important is a bill that's reining in our PBMs. For those of you who don't know what a pharmacy benefit manager is, it's the middle person in between your pharmacies and the drug manufacturing companies. They're the ones that were supposed to be, uh, for instance, you know, it's a little bit easier for a high V pharmacy with a national network to negotiate prices on heart 
uh, on heart medication or blood pressure medication. Well, it's not so easy for a pharmacy in our small towns. So pharmacy benefit managers were intended to be the accounting billing hub to make sure that drug medications can get to pharmacies so they can get to all of you. That was their original intent. Um, unfortunately, they have, create, they have been, with, without a lack of fencing, they have created a monster in themselves. And we uncovered two years ago um, a pharmacy in Wapolo County in the prison system needed a bottle of heart medication for a prisoner. Well, they were charged $250 by the PBM for this bottle of medication. Guess how much the PBM had to pay to get it? 25 bucks. So they pocketed $225. So if you want to know one of, one of the leading reasons for why your prescription drug costs are so high, it is this unfiltered, unregulated middle bureaucracy which are exploiting all of your dollars for higher prescription drug costs. So we're working for Representative Forbes and Representative Best uh, to make sure that we can attempt to rein them in. Happy to be here today and looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Bobby. Uh, Representative Nielsen. Bobby stole my microphone. <laughs> Oh, thanks. Yeah. Because <laughs> giving me two microphones is a really good idea today. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to the League of Women Voters um, for doing this for us every session. Um, I enjoy being here and hearing what um, your issues are and what everyone here has to say. Um, <clears throat> I serve on state government, um, and so I don't want to be the only one up here that doesn't say something nice about Bobby, except for I just can't think of anything. <laughs> so I'll say I like your shirt. That hurts, Amy. <laughs> no, we're all good friends, don't worry. Um, uh, so I serve on state government. You've heard a lot of the bills that we've had through there. I serve on Ways and Means, which luckily Dave takes it easy on me in the first half, um, because uh, a lot of the meteor bills come in Ways and that happens later, so haven't done a lot there, but um, I am ranking member on Commerce, and we've done a couple of um, really good bills to help um, increase broadband access across uh, rural areas here in Iowa, um, and I believe next week we'll start work on um, what was called the Sunshine Tax Bill last year, um, now just the solar bill. Um, there was an awful lot of work done by many stakeholder groups um, on that bill to come to an agreement that everyone could um, could live with. I, I heard not everyone is, is exactly um, happy with it, and not everyone is really mad, so it's perfect legislation as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Um, so I, I won't take up more time, but I um, want to hear your questions, but thanks for having me. Thanks to each of you for your updates on the legislative issues. We really appreciate hearing from everyone. And at this time, we will begin our questions. We're going to start with one from the League, and one then from each co-sponsor, and then we'll follow that with questions from the audience. The League question. In 2010, a 63% majority of Iowans supported implementation of a constitutionally protected trust fund to help achieve several environmental goals. In a study by the Hydro Science and Engineering Department at the University of Iowa entitled Iowa Stream Nitrate and the Gulf of Mexico, Iowa was found to comprise 23% of the land area but is responsible for 45% of the nitrate nitrogen pollution that flows into the Mississippi River. Increasing sales tax, three-eighths of a percent, could help alleviate this water quality problem. What will you do as a legislator to support funding for the Iowa Water and Land Legacy Trust Fund in 2020? And that's the I will, which I think some of you have mentioned. Thank you. Well, we talked about the, the, the governor's tax proposal earlier, which includes this in it, and people are disappointed in that her proposal takes, uh, I'm, I'm going to up the numbers, there's actually a really good report that's been put out by the Iowa Fiscal Partnership that gives a really detailed analysis, Iowa Fiscal Partnership, you can see this report that compares what we, what we passed in 2010 against what the governor's proposed, so I direct your attention to that, the details. Um, so it's been kind of a bait and switch. Um, I think the advocates for this saw a, a major new infusion of resources to fight some of our top environmental problems. The, the, original, the, the original formula had about 60% of the money going to private land conservation work. So conservation uh, equals better water quality. 
um, and the, the current formula moves more money in that direction, and it takes money away, as I said earlier, from kind of more urban outdoor rec stuff that we all ought to have access to. Um, so the governor's proposal is just a proposal. I suspect that there will be maybe a House tax proposal, and I know there's going to be a Senate tax proposal, whether it just does parts of, there's some, there's, there's interest to get that trigger out of the way so this, those tax cuts that are on the books happen. It is an election year, and generally people don't raise taxes in election years, especially if you never like to raise taxes. So it's, it's kind of questionable whether we're going to see that. Um, so in my concern, <coughs> actually, process-wise, is that if we do see a tax bill from uh, re Republicans uh, on the second floor, that we'll see it about April 16th and will adjourn on April 18th. And m nobody in the entire building will have had a chance to read the bill because we won't have any time to actually see it. But there is support to try and get this done. Um, I'm, not sure it's, I'm not sure what the prospects are. Well, there's a keen interest in the 38 cent. Uh, it's actually sections 59 through 87 of the governor's bill. My personal opinion, I don't know why we just don't deal with the 38 cent itself and deal with the original formula that was voted on in 2010 and work together to get that piece through. The other five eights is muddled with pluses and minuses and winners and losers. Uh, uh, it's, I think, it, pardon the phrase, it waters down what we're trying to do in terms of the environment. Uh, it, the, the new proposal also takes money away from trails, makes it harder for the government or nonprofit entities to accept land that landowners actually want to sell or deed for conservation. It prevents the DNR and others from using any money raised through the tax system to purchase this property. We just need to go back to 2010. We need to look at the three eighths. We have the technology, we can do three eighths of a cent. And then go to the original formula that all of us voted on about a decade ago. I just, to answer your question, I first want to give some background. And there's this seemingly accepted acceptance that agriculture is not already doing a lot to reduce the pollutions that are going into our water, because we absolutely are. Um, the nutrient reduction strategy has done some good things. It doesn't go as far as some people would like, but it's doing good things. There's this misconception that farmers want to waste nitrogen. Have you ever bought nitrogen before? <laughs> it's exceptionally expensive. And, and certainly not something that anybody wants to waste. You know, most farmers intend to pass on their property and their farms to the next generation. And it's in their own best interest to make sure that the next generation has clean water and good land. And I also want to remind you that not all pollution comes from farms. So those are some things that I want to make sure that, that we touch base on. As far as whether we would do three-eighths of I will as is, I could support that. I support the original formula. That's what people think they were voting on. And as far as uh, Senator Bolcom's question on whether the Invest in Iowa Act is going to happen this year, I, I, I don't think so. There's just not enough groundswell of support. I know that's what the governor is trying to do in her town halls, and if, if she's able to change a bunch of hearts and minds, maybe it would be on life support. But right now, I just don't see it happening. I don't, I don't see it happening when I've had the governor's office come up and pull me down to their office twice trying to get me to come in and support this legislation. Uh, they're going after the Democrats now that they feel may support them. I, I don't like the way that this bill is laid out. It, it, to me, it can be very regressive. It, uh, uh, it's just, it's on life support right now, I think. Uh, we, we uh, as far as the three-eighths of a cent, I can ag agree with Dave. If we want to do the three-eighths, let's just do the three-eighths, leave the rest of it, and do that portion of the bill. Either way, I can vote for it. I did not, I was not in the legislature when the, the formula was come up. The formula was not actually voted on. It was the, 
the bill itself allowing it to do that. I think people assumed that, that that's what they were, were voting on. Uh, but I can go either way on that. I would like to try to get that three-eighths passed. So anyone who thought that this was an actual increase to environmental programs needs to know that it is not. The governor's plan cuts funding to REAP, cuts funding to the Environmental First Fund. It is basically a shift. It is no new monies. It's just saying we're going to take that I will penny, the three-eighths of a cents, cent, and put it towards existing funds. It's just a replacement. So it's not an increase at all, which is what the environmental groups were promised. And so that's why I think people need to see through this and understand that it does not accomplish what was originally intended and what the voters voted on. It's in the legislation. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. <clears throat> now we'll have the questions from the sponsoring from the co-sponsors today and if you would be willing I'd like to just call up each group one at a time um, so we're, we're going to hear from 100 grannies first um, we will re a reminder that you will have one minute to pose your question so I'll just say it off script not a speech um, legislators you have two minutes then to respond and in order to maximize the number of questions, then you will be timed. Um, you have one minute to state your question. And after that minute, if you've not stated your question, I will ask you to please do so. So please be respectful of those guidelines. As you do come forward, please speak directly into the microphone, introduce yourself, and, if, and the rec organization that you represent. You may redirect your question to any or all legislators. If you have a second question, you'll have to wait until others have had a chance. Okay, so 100 grannies first. Hello. Morning. Morning. My name Morning. is Tina Kapp, and I'm from the 100 grannies. And a year ago, I went with a group. Oh, the microphone's not on. Is that better? Okay, all right. So um, a year ago, I joined a group and I went to Des Moines and we lobbied against um, a ban for uh, concentrated animal feeding operations, also known as CAFOs in Iowa. And I think that happened again recently. Um, and as we know, the spills from the factory farms result in fish kills and ammonia pollution and impaired waterways. My main focus today is just to kind of talk about the waterways, even though there's lots of other things we can talk about with CAFOs. And Iowa is a bad neighbor. We are, we are very much of a bad neighbor because our water, with its increased nitrogen and phosphorus, run into the Gulf of Mexico, widening the dead zone. So a majority of Iowans, 63%, and this is kind of new information, that has just come from the College of Public Health, um, shows that 63% of Iowans really support a ban on any new and expanded existing CAFOs in Iowa. So my question is, when will the General Assembly pass this much needed ban on new and existing CAFOs in the state of Iowa? It did not make it out of funnel in the Senate, I don't believe it did in the House either. Uh, so it will, we will not have a vote on it this year. Uh, the other thing for me is the one way that I can get a young person back on a farm to begin farming is through livestock production. I am not against, or I am not for a moratorium on CAFOs, I am for someone that does a very good job and is responsible for applying manure and, and taking care of their ground. To me, uh, there is the ability in Iowa, we are buying so much 
fertilizer, commercial fertilizer, we have anhydrous ammonia in which we are applying to our soil and we are uh, still putting nutrients, those nutrients in the fields for the crops. There can be different ways to do that, split applying, uh, different, uh, uh, different delivery methods that we should be using. Uh, I am for uh, what the uh, DNR director has just done here. It uh, took effect two days ago in not allowing multiple LLCs to place hog buildings on a site and try to skirt around the manure management plans in which they have to follow. Uh, this was done through rules. We've been trying to do th this the last few years and uh, Director Lyons uh, has gotten this done uh, that that uh, you cannot have multiple buildings in one site to try to get around a manure management plan. Right, well, okay, and another, uh, just, just to kind of put things into perspective, I just wanted to say that 23 million hogs are now in these containment feeding operations in Iowa, and the fecal equivalent of that manure is equivalent to a population of 138 million people. And I just want everyone in, their, in this room to think about that. And I'm well aware of that statistic, and that's a really good thing. You know why? Because it's feeding the world. The world needs food. And that's why this crowd is represented by a lot of people that are your sink, that you're implying are bad people. They're doing bad things. Let me finish, please. So I completely disagree with you. I will never support a moratorium. Because most of these farmers, in fact, I would say all but maybe a couple, because there's bad actors in every industry, are extremely good people. That you talk about rampant spills, that doesn't exist. Do you have any idea how valuable the liquid manure is? It's exceptionally valuable. So nobody wants to go out there and just spill it. So Bobby, no, I, I do mic? not support that. Most Senator, farmers are or, really good excuse people. Excuse me, is your mic off? No, it doesn't say it is. Oh, okay. Maybe I yes. said what I need to say. Okay, <laughs> all right. Thank you. Does anyone else want to yeah, respond? Yeah, just a couple observations. I mean, um, this is a challenging issue. Um, agriculture is a really important industry in Iowa. Animal agriculture is a very important industry in Iowa. But there's no doubt we have challenges. And over the last 10 years, we've seen a doubling in the amount of nitrate going out of Iowa in our rivers and streams. Not a decrease, but an in, a substantial increase at a time when we have a nutrient reduction strategy that everybody wants to be successful with, okay? So if you look at the, the records that, are, uh, that you can look at in every county about anhydrous sales, people, are, people producing crops are buying anhydrous ammonia at the rates in which they should. And what is it, 180 pounds an acre for corn? Um, and, and, and if you look at every county, you see that store-bought anhydrous is being purchased, right? And then we have all this a animal waste that is also a, a valuable nutrient, right? And you have some farmers that have to file uh, manure management plans if they're of a certain size. And, and I think one of the things that we could do would be to try and figure out a way to electronically get those manure management plans uh, available so that we make sure that somebody, two or three farmers aren't using the same property to say, here's where our waste is going. So that would be something we could do, right? We're not going to do a moratorium. What are some other improvements? So if you're, if you're buying as much anhydrous as you need to produce a corn crop in Iowa and you have this manure, um, then, it, then you're putting on too much. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we do. So that so that's one that's one thing we could do. And and you know it's it's a little bit of an insurance program, right? Throw a little more nitrogen on uh, to get get your crops. But at the at the same time, you have all these cities and and folks downstream that Thanks. see too much nitrogen. So I, I think that's a that would be something that we could do proactively 
with people in agriculture <laughs> so we, we don't have people using the same farm on their plan and we've got several farmers. So it would be simple to do that because as you point out, um, and you, your figures are a little off, you, you need to include uh, dairy cattle, regular old cattle, mm -hmm. chickens and turkeys and hogs and mm -hmm. you get to 130 million approximate people equivalent waste. We have three million people in Iowa, okay? So we got work to do and we need to, get, we need to encourage more farmers to participate as volunteers. I know everybody thinks they're doing all they can do, but we need more volunteers. When 60% of the ground is rented, and the landlord's somewhere else, mm -hmm. not having any, any kind of, not paying close attention, uh, then we don't get the conservation we're looking for. So at the end of the day, we've got to work together on this. Uh, we've not been inclined to do a regulatory approach, okay? So if we're gonna have a voluntary approach, we gotta figure out a way to get more volunteers. Thank you. Tina, I, I was just going to comment that 89 counties, and these are our county supervisors with large and small counties, have signed on to the master matrix resolution that basically says uh, it gives supervisors the ability to recommend factory farms for denial. Okay. So that's 89 counties, and those are small rural counties along with our big, right? Yeah. So I signed on to the moratorium on factory farms and CAFOs until we revisit the master matrix. Mm -hmm. Because we know, and I don't think anybody in here disagrees, it hasn't been revisited in a long time. Yes. And what we found is that people go right below the threshold so they don't have to abide by it. Thank you. And we all Thank know you. that. Thank you. And we know that that's been part of the problem. So yes. in order for us to move forward, I'd like to lock them in a room again, Amy, and, and provide no water or drink or food and, and no restroom breaks until we figure this out. Because right now, what we're doing is not working. And we have 89 counties that have told us that. Right. And, and so 63% let's, of, peop, of Iowans And let's sit down and get it figured out yeah. so that we are doing something good for the environment, protects farmers, in terms of their ability to farm, I get that, mm -hmm. but we've got to come to some resolution that is going to make this state better to live in. Right. Thanks. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And anyone else want to respond to that question? Also, um, Senator Kinney has taken me to a couple of um, you know farms where um, they raise animals, and they they do it in a very responsible way. I mean, they. They show their manure management plans. They can show all of their paperwork. I mean, there, there's a lot of rules and regulations that are already in place that go in. Now, just like everything else, there's bad actors. And so it's hard to say you're going to completely stop one thing that so many people are doing so well because a few are not. So, I, I mean, I've listened to, you know, Senator Bolcom, Senator Kinney, Representative Kaufman, Representative Masher. At, each one of these people has had like something that we, you know, need to pick out and and work on. So, I just think that we need to. I agree with Mary. We need to make them sit in a room. We need to make everybody <laughs> sit in a room. No potty breaks, and uh, and and talk about this and make and make something that works for everyone, but catches the people that are doing it wrong instead of punishing the people who are doing it right. And Tina, I just wanted to mention Cedar County is one of the counties that did sign on to that. Okay. Good. Well, Thanks. Aware. Thank you. <laughs> I Thank knew you. you were. Just wanted to point it out. All right. Thank you very much. So could we have the representative from CAFE come forward with their question? Hello. I'm Eileen Fisher, and I'm the president of CAFE Iowa Can, also CAFE Johnson County. We have a local chapter, if any of you would like to join us. So uh, we have three legislative priorities, and they all have to do with reducing tobacco uh, death and disease caused by tobacco use. So the most effective thing you can do is to increase the price. Um, we, our objective is to raise the price on cigarettes by $1.50 a pack and with an equivalent or parallel increase on other tobacco products. That's probably not going to happen this year. So uh, the uh, 
one of our other objectives is to add the vaping e-cigarettes and vaping products to the Smoke-Free Air Act and also remove the exemption for casinos. There are 9,200 employees working in casinos still exposed to secondhand smoke. And then the third uh, bill that we've been working with uh, Representative Holt on, which may actually make it through, is just to add e-cigarettes and vapor products, define them as a tobacco product. Because indeed, the nicotine that's in e-cigarettes comes from tobacco. These products are not, have not been regulated or taxed like tobacco products. So um, Representative Holt is working on a bill which would be a, a tax, considered a tax bill, so it wasn't subject to the funnel. So I would just like to ask um, a, a Representative Kaufman if he's heard any news about that, because I don't believe it has a bill number or it has been introduced yet. Yep, good question, Eileen. Thank you for being here after we visited two weeks ago at the Capitol. Is my mic working? I don't know. It's, I don't think it is quite. I don't either. How's that? Yeah. Okay, I'll just speak louder. Um, <laughs> Representative Holt and I both serve on Ways and Means, and I approached him after we talked, and he did confirm that he's working on a bill draft. He's chair of judiciary, and I'm chair of state government, so we haven't been working on Ways and Means bill until after this first funnel happened. So I predict that you'll see a bill number in the next week or so. I told him I'd be willing to be a co-sponsor and push to make it happen. Thank you. I'll be okay. short. All right. There thank you go. You. There, there is a bill um, in the Senate that's still alive that would raise the minimum age for both tobacco and vaping products to 21 which has been, been done federally. We need to do it in Iowa so that we can enforce it in Iowa, but with state people. And I think it's an, that bill provides an opportunity for workplace ban, like, like tobacco, you can't smoke at work. Um, <coughs> I think that's possible. Um, uh, it's more challenging, as you know, on the tax issue to do parity with tobacco products. But we at least have a vehicle, I think, to have the conversation about. Yep, and we would support raising this. The federal government has already done that. Yeah. We would support raising it to 21. But in our view, getting tobacco defined, or e-cigarettes defined as a tobacco product needs to go hand in hand with that Agreed. bill. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, the representative from the Iowa City Climate Activists. <coughs> Sierra Club. Sierra Club. Yeah, my name's Tom Carson. Okay. I'm with the Iowa City Area Sierra Club. Uh, the climate activist lobby. Oh. Okay, all right. I'm up here now. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, I have a question and a clarification. Uh, last year was a painful memory. Uh, I'm referring to the uh, solar energy bill that Amy referred to. Last year was a painful memory of the utilities oh, I don't know how to describe it, it eviscerated uh, solar energy for use for many people and groups. And they had a, a, I'm sure you remember watching the terrible TV ads where they lied about many things. Anyway, there is, to use a pun, uh, brighter news this year uh, where there is now a bill uh, that is starting the process that essentially preserves the status quo uh, with the exchange of uh, creating in five years what's called a value of solar uh, study, which tries to monetize the actual uh, uh, costs and benefits to utilities between uh, residential and business users of solar uh, to the utilities. And my question is, again, part of a clarification, if you can explain that, if, that, if my explanation is correct, I'm not clear on what it does to, I know it uh, uh, grandfathers or grandmothers in uh, present solar users, I'm not sure what it does to future solar users. And if you can talk a little bit more about the value of solar uh, study, and in essence, is it a good bill worth supporting? Tom, excellent question. I, I have a different view of last year. I have last year as a good memory because well, we won. Thank you for helping stop <laughs> A bad bill. But. We told Mid America, <coughs> excuse me, we told Medic America and Alliance. Well, there's something I would like to say that we said, but there's young ears in the audience. <laughs> um, but we told Mid America and Alliance that you have a really bad bill and we're not going to support it. Right. Um, the value solar study, I think it's going to work in our favor. 
I think that the utilities are hoping that the value solar study is going to show maybe that it's only partially good. I think the value solar study is going to show what you and I both know, which is that solar has an incredible impact and effect on not only the environment, but also just the grid itself. Um, I have not had a chance to read the whole bill because I don't serve on commerce, but I have had a chance to speak with the solar groups who I think are a reflection of a lot of the grassroots. And so far, they have said that they believe this is going to end up being a very positive bill for solar. I'd be happy to get more details for you in the future on that. Um, I'm actually sponsoring legislation with Representative Klein to increase the solar tax credit. It's one of the most wildly popular credits in the entire state. It works wonderfully. And I've got people sitting on the waiting list that, that want to uh, do more for that. And I would agree with your assessment that it grandfathers in and codifies that no current solar should ever be touched. But the way I'm understanding it, it provides a pathway forward to protect them as well. I know I'm being vague because I haven't read it yet, but I'm just speak, speaking off of conversations I've had with the advocates. I'll be doing a full column about it in the future, <coughs> outlining all the details. Thanks. I've met with the Moxie Solar. I've met with uh, and spoken with Atwood Electric that does the solar projects in uh, Keokuk, Washington County, and, and, and they feel that this is going to be a plus. Um, Representative Nielsen and I went down to Washington County uh, because Washington County has is the number one solar uh, county in the state for uh, solar and they had these Tesla batteries mm -hmm. uh, that store. Uh, that store electricity and they have and have put it on the lines so they don't have to build more infrastructure there that these these batteries can take off the solar panels that's not being used at, uh, uh, by the panels they store it there for peak periods of time and it's saving them millions of dollars by not having to upgrade the, the services uh, to their customers down there. Right. Uh, I mean, there's so many good things coming out of that, and all I know is from what I've, I've talked to my installers and people that are selling them now. I, I think it's a, I think the we've made a breakthrough and I, I give credit to mid American energy who as you pointed out had kind of a mean campaign last year with disinformation also the Iowa pork producers deserve credit right. for for their help in n helping negotiate this they deserve credit for stopping a bad bill last year and right. I think for where we are where we are this year um, I think the value of solar study uh, advocates hope will show that it's actually a benefit to ratepayers that individuals, homeowners, businesses, people in agriculture have deployed solar uh, investments at, the, at where they work and, and, and live. Um, think about it like this. We've probably had about $300 million <coughs> in private investment for uh, in Iowa. If, if MidAmerican goes out and spends $300 million to, in, to expand the capacity of what they can generate, they get to charge all of us for that investment, that capital investment in generation. Uh, this capital investment's largely been done by pri private people that d get a rate of return because they save electricity at some point when their system is paid for. But that's, a, that's, a, that's one of the things this value of solar will tell us. Also, the value of solar will look at on those hot days in July and August when Jim Throgmorton and Barbara are generating electricity at their home, MidAmerican doesn't have to go out on the grid when it's really expensive and buy power. Uh, and then, of course, when they buy more expensive power, we all pay for it. So those are a couple things. And then there's less, there's less loss of electricity if you're generating it right where you're using it in terms of like line loss. I don't know much about that. Um, other people here do. So I think in Minnesota they've done this and they've shown some value. It's great that MidAmericans agreed to this study. But I think the thing Bobby pointed out earlier, the, cre the current credit is completely subscribed. It's fi at $5 million. Uh, I think Tim Dwight recently said they've got like $10 million worth of people in line. We could really boost that credit. It's one of the few credits that actually creates jobs in all 99 counties. It's one of the few credits that puts small business people to work. We got a lot of credits for the 
Microsoft <coughs> and Facebook, but uh, this is a really good one that's, that I hope we could, I'm, I'm glad to hear you're thinking about moving it. So Tom, I was just gonna comment that it was your efforts last year that brought Mid-America to the table this year. Yeah. So that is enormous. And, and Joe is right, that was the pork producers who in Washington County have been one of the biggest users of solar on confinement operations. Right. So right. it's, you know, that politics makes strange bedfellows. That's an example of that. But I was just gonna mention, Moxie is looking into producing panels here in Iowa. And that's, I know, woo-hoo is right. We should all be woo-hooing. Um, that's, again, jobs, it's economic development, it's all of that for our area. And again, many people have been buying from cheaper Chinese companies, and they haven't always been as good of a product as some of the ones built right here in the United States. I bought mine from uh, Tim Cruzy in Des Moines and Greenlight Renewables. <coughs> um, he's not working any longer, unfortunately. But um, that particular company was buying out of Washington State. But wouldn't it be great to produce some right here in Iowa? And so those are the kinds of things that we're seeing happening. And again, I think the closer to home, the better. Absolutely. So that's where we are. Yeah. yeah, it was fantastic news when I found out this last week about the agreement, but it's got a ways to go. Yeah. So everyone here, uh, I hope we can get it over the finish line this so session. To clarify, it's just through the, is through the committee on Friday, on the House Committee on Friday? Um, there's the, the first subcommittee is Monday. Yeah. Subcommittee, oh, yeah. okay, yeah. okay. In the House. It's at the very beginning stage. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay, well, thank you. Okay, thank you. Iowa City climate activist. Advocate. Oh, sorry, <laughs> advocate. Are you active also? <laughs> uh, some days we are. <laughs> Um, my name's Peter Rolnick. I'm with Iowa City Climate Advocates and with Citizens Climate Lobby. And first I want to say thank you uh, for all the work that I know you've been doing, but I've learned a lot today and I'm impressed by how much more bipartisanship there is going on than what I hear about in the news. And so that's a good thing and I really appreciate that. Um, especially on the, this year on the Missouri and on the Mississippi rivers, the climate crisis is hitting farmers hard. In the long run, sustainable practices that keep carbon in the soil, such as no-till cover crops, managed grazing, and more varied crop rotation, can store carbon, protect topsoil, reduce runoff, increase resilience to floods, and improve the farmer's bottom line. However, most farmers cannot afford the cost to make that transition. They are barely getting by as is. What are your ideas for making it profitable for farmers to transition to more sustainable methods? I, I guess I would completely disagree with what you just said. Okay. I mean, <clears throat> I live around literally thousands of farmers between Johnson, Cedar, and Muscatine County. I don't know of one that isn't attempting to employ more conservation efforts <clears throat> that doesn't cost a lot of money. I don't know one that can't afford to no-till that actually saves money. I don't know one that doesn't want to put out cover crops that actually makes things more profitable because A, you can graze earlier in the spring when you would traditionally be feeding hay or silage, um, but now you can be Instead of feeding all of that, you can be putting your sheep, your cattle, that's, that's what I do. Uh, hopefully by the 15th of March, I'll be able to put cattle out on, on a cover crop because we're having a decent winter. So I guess I, I agree with your premise that we need to be doing more of this. I think you're right about that. Uh, solar, you look at nutrient reduction strategy. I just, in Cedar Johnson and Muscatine counties, the farmers that I know are doing all of that. I don't think it costs a lot, and I think they're actually getting a value for it. I think one of the things we, when we talked about the formula for Iowa, if we ever get to fund this thing, that we should redirect the formula to have as a top priority uh, flood protection, flood prevention, flood control. That 
this year. The money, that ought to be the top thing. This week, the Senate voted on a bill we got from the House for $21 million for <coughs> flood relief that's mostly going to southwest Iowa. There was $164 million worth of projects. The state came up with $21 million. Um, and so I think when, when we invest on, on, in conservation that as, as a priority reduces flooding, we get the benefit, we get soil water quality benefits with that. And I think that as we look at that formula, I think uh, flooding ought to be and reducing flooding because uh, there's a new paper out actually, I just got a link to it from Gene Tockley and Bill Gutowski, they're two meteorology, climate scientists at Iowa State theory. University. is a really good paper, basically, on climate. They're climate people, uh, long-term faculty members at Iowa State that are predicting uh, more extreme precipitation in the, in the next few decades. We're going to continue to see the kind of, and they, they lay out why they think that is, but we have a lot more work to do on flood reduction, and uh, I think we get a too bad, you know, a, a double bonus when we put it first for flood protection um, as a priority. One, one of the things that uh, I think we need to do more of is education. And uh, one of those things that, you know, I've learned a lot from two gentlemen from Washington County, uh, Steve Berger and uh, Rob Stout, and going out to their uh, operations, finding out how they're using cover crops. Um, I didn't know a thing about cover crops when I went to the state legislature, and I sat on the Ag and Natural Re Resources uh, uh, budget sub meetings, and they began coming in here and talking about uh, cover crops and so forth. And then uh, I got a hold of Kate, and we set up a plan in, in which I began using cover crops. I use it for pasture and, and so forth for my cattle, and and uh, in trying to offset the cost of, of putting them out. So I'm, I'm getting a benefit back. Uh, and Bobby's right, you can get your cattle out on, on uh, pasture much quicker. Uh, looking at different cover crops, uh, the uh, radishes and, and so forth that break up your soil, uh, you don't have to use a tillage, uh, or a tillage uh, practice because the these radishes get huge. Uh, they are they are breaking the soil up and, and taking the uh, hard pan out of, of the uh, soil in a lot of cases. Uh, so there's there's a lot of different things we can use. Um, w we have to look at putting wetlands in uh, on some of our lower ground ground that is susceptible to uh, flooding. Uh, I think a lot of that is is working and learning uh, and going down and seeing what a bioreactor does uh, and, and how it's taking the nitrogen out of the soil. I mean, there's a, there's a new practice that they're talking about, the oxbow, uh, putting water, tile water into an old stream uh, where where it's low back away from the creek and letting it settle in there before it goes <coughs> into the creek and how how that really reduces uh, the, the nitrogen that, that's going into the water. So there's a lot of practices that are are being done and they're coming up with them all the time. Uh, uh, there's just uh, different uh, things that we can do, but a lot of it has to be education. And that's why in, again, in Washington County, they're number one in cover crops in the state of Iowa because of the uh, because their neighbor does it, sees the benefit of it, and then they do it. But Joe is right. There's a lot of rented ground in this state that uh, we've got to educate those absentee landowners uh, on the benefit and how it's making their soil better uh, to be able to hold the carbon and so forth. So Peter, I was just going to comment really quickly. Peter, this <coughs> fall, Kevin had a, uh, an ag day for us, legislators from across eastern Iowa, from across the state, in Sigourney. And so we met with farmers and had those discussions. And what they told us is their grant programs that we have through the state, the money's gone mid-year. And so 
you know, they want to be able to utilize that as an avenue for them to be able to improve water quality and to put those practices in place. But if there's not the funding to support them, it's difficult for them to be able to do that. And so one of the things that we can do is stretch those dollars, put more money into it so that they're able to do what they need to do to mitigate some of those nitrogen runoff, phosphorus, all of those things that we've talked about. I want to go see Kevin's enormous radishes. Yeah. I think that would be fun. We need a field trip out to Kevin's farm to take a look at him. He was describing him to me, and it sounded like James and the Giant Peach or something out of that. But the other thing I wanted to mention, I got to do a flyover on the Mississippi this um, spring when the flooding was occurring. And it was with the Corps of Engineers. And so we were in a small plane. We went clear down to Hannibal, Missouri. And they showed us all of the levee breaches along the Mississippi. And what they were showing us is we're not replacing that one. We're replacing this <clears throat> one. But the, they were showing where there is going to be long-term flooding. And it doesn't make much sense for us to put money back into replacing levees that are going to flood year after year after year. So they talked a lot about wetlands and the fact that when we put $21 million into wetlands over in, excuse me, flood restoration over on the Missouri, then we're looking at some farmland that probably isn't going to be farmable anymore. And we need to start getting real about that and recognizing that that probably needs to be wetland and we need to talk about that whether it's buying those farmers out or whatever we need to do but it doesn't make much sense for us to put dollars your dollars state dollars into areas that are going to continually flood so i'm anxious to look at that study joe and to find out where is that that we need to be more cognizant of not replacing and building those up again when we know those levees are going to flood. And so those are the kinds of things we need to have an honest discussion about that so that we're using those dollars well. Okay. I'm gonna come back with one other thing that really makes sense to me is we're trying to create jobs in rural Iowa and by doing a lot of these conservation practices and so forth, we are employing a lot of individuals in these rural communities that are doing this contractor's work and by putting this money, that this, the money that the state puts up to be used as cost share, uh, there, are, there are a lot of jobs that are created by what we are doing. Well, thank you all very much. Thanks, Peter. Thank you for your question. Okay, we can now accept questions from oh. <laughs> get out. accept questions from the audience. If you do if you do come forward and are representing an organization, please let us know that as well. And just as we, uh, I will reiterate that um, you have where am I here? <clears throat> you have a minute to state your question and um, then we'll go forward. Go ahead. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me, my, my name is Lynn Gallagher, I live near Solon. I'm gonna change gears, um, and I thought I had three minutes, so I'm gonna talk fast and ad lib a little. Um, I wanted to talk about a, a bill, a study bill in the House and Senate about capping, not, having a hard cap on non-economic damages in medical malpractice cases. The reason I'm interested in this is because I had medical malpractice happen to me, and I didn't understand the system until it happened to me. What I found out was medical errors are common. Physicians almost don't, often don't tell you they make a mistake and physicians often do protect each other because this happened to me. Found out it's hard to file a lawsuit even if your evidence is clear and persuasive that most people don't get any compensation and just have to live with the physical, emotional, and financial consequences of a mistake that the doctor made. There's really just no accountability in our system. I mean, think about it if you want to figure out a good doctor, how, how do you even know? Um, I gave you all a copy of David Lynn's article, which is great. It talks about myths about tort reform. I'm just going to read a couple, just a little bit of it. The to quote, the tort reform push in Iowa does nothing to address the root causes of why prevent preventable medical errors occur in the first place. Medical errors are the third leading cause of death in the United States. True reform should not come in the form of caps, but rather how Iowa medical organizations practice and behave in the delivery of medical care. 
Additionally, the small proportion of Iowa physicians who make up about half of medical malpractice costs must be held accountable, primarily through the authority and appropriate action of the Iowa Board of Medicine. So my question is, what are your thoughts about these bills and will you oppose them? The bill died, Lynn, and I do not expect it to come back up. Okay. It, it seems to come up every few years, this Well, I meant, I'm sorry. I'm, the bill died for this session. It's, it's traditionally filed every year, but it has officially died for this session, and I don't think the support is there for it to happen even next year. It's just there are a lot of problems with it. The bill is dead, and I expect it to continue to die. Thank you very much. I was on the subcommittee in the Senate. It's alive in the Senate yet. It passed the committee? Yes. yes. Uh, to me, we have five cases that they are focusing their attention on. Of those five cases, a woman with four children was given a medication in which they were in her record said that she was allergic to. She was given this medication and she died. She had an allergic reaction. Uh, a case that they were hitting me on was out of Washington County in which a woman uh, was having a child, uh, there was complications in the delivery, and the child now has to be taken care of the rest of their lives because, because of these injuries. The doctor had come from, I believe, four mm -hmm. other hospitals and uh, had been uh, reprimanded. They have lost their license now, and uh, you put a price. They, they did amend it to be $750,000 now cap, but to take care of a child for the next 50 years, what's that going to cost? Uh, this woman was awarded, I believe, an, on uh, seven, $7 million for this. But the other thing is people don't realize when you're suing and the, the money that you're, you're insurance company pays for, your, your benefits paid for, pay for, that is deducted and you don't have a claim to the, those uh, benefits. Uh, there is, I believe, $11 million collected in premiums and $3.5 million is paid out in claims. So there is a large percentage that the insurance companies are making on their malpractice in insurance. And uh, the other thing that they're claiming is the OBGYN clinics are all closing down uh, all across the states. In Washington County, uh, when they closed the OBGYN clinic, uh, they were in contact with me, told me they were going to be closing it and everything else. It's because there are, were not women having babies Enough. in rural Iowa, enough of them, uh, and that's why the clinics was closing. So then let me amend my statement. If the Senate passes it, it will not pass the House. Thank you. Um, the Iowa City Community School District um, has a good organization called the District Parent Organization where we can go and ask the school board and the administration questions. And like, we keep asking them, like, why are you cutting administration? Why are you cutting, you know, school counselors? So on and so forth. Why are you cutting Spanish? Um, and it's always because the state isn't funding it enough. Can you guys give us an update on the supplementals? What's the SSA? And tell us, um, please, can we have more money for our schools? It's good to hear from, it's good to hear from you, Miriam. Oh, you didn't mention your name. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm Miriam Timmer Hackert. And I've got kids at West and at Coralville Central. And it would just be really nice if the school district had like more money than inflation so that they could give teachers raises and you know hire special needs teachers and all that nice stuff. Yeah, right now it's stuck between 2.1% in the Senate, 2.5% in the House. If it were Dave's world, we'd be looking at a baseline of 3% every year. I think it's time we also go to two-year funding. Yeah. That way, administrators aren't spending so much time six months out of the year or handing out pink slips. Frankly, I think it should be a baseline of 3%, and we should do a plus 1% for the schools who want to do an individual success plan for each student with something that involves STEAM. But I, I, someday, I hope we go to that two-year plan 
and 3% is barely where we should be. And the key point is we do have the dollars to do that. So the state of Iowa writes the single biggest check to K-12 public schools. So I do believe that we reflect education being a top priority. I have seven public educators in my immediate orbit, family and friends. And so I hear about public education issues all the time. Uh, the House has proposed 2.5%, but that is 2.5% of $3.3 billion. So what we're proposing is a $108 million increase. And Representative Masher and I always have a disagreement on, on part of the dollars being property tax dollars, so I'm not going to go there. But what I'm going to say is that the Cedar Rapids Gazette, which no one would take for a conservative bastion, did an in-depth nationwide study and has stated that the state of Iowa is in the top five in the entire country in the last 10 years for the percentage of our budget that goes through K-12 public ed education. So I do think, while it's not as much as you want it to be, I do think the state of Iowa is making education its top priority. I actually think the Gazette is a conservative bastion. <laughs> so I disagree with the whole premise the on, the, on the uh, editorial board. Yeah, I still think it leans that way. But I, 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 we really need to look, you know, you can talk about baselines and from what years. Historically, over the last 10 years, we have not funded our schools at an adequate rate, and our test scores are showing that. Number one in the country at ACT. Miriam, I was, I was just going to comment that a lot of the funding that Representative Kaufman is talking about is categorical, so it needs to go towards special education, towards ELP, gifted, talented, ELL. So we have those categorical areas for a good reason, right? But for the general operating, that's where we're suffering. And right now, we've got this class management bill that's put, that is basically putting out this $1.6 million carrot with the $500,000 for transportation that affects 150 kids statewide when we know the needs are so much greater. And if we would fund it on the front end in terms of just giving schools the funding they need, we wouldn't need this other categorical for what they're calling therapeutic classrooms. So I, I look at, you know, again, we're trying to put a Band-Aid on something that if we funded it adequately to begin with, we wouldn't need the Band-Aid. And that's where we run into the problems. There is a great deal of those dollars that Representative Kaufman is talking about that is property tax relief. And we need to be clear about that because it doesn't go to education in terms of an increase. It's a replacement. And so we need to make sure people understand that and know the difference. Thank you. Okay, next. Hi, my, hi, my name is Kayleen Reeve and I moved over to Johnson County from Cedar County um, just last fall and I don't know, I, I haven't seen that many cover crops in Cedar County where I lived. The people would allow the fields to just get weeds in it from the year before, and then all of a sudden one day it'd be sprayed and they would all be dead. That's the way they were preparing the fields. And I lived right by there and um, I really feel like we need to talk about the elephant in the room, Monsanto. We need to ban Roundup 10 years ago. It should never, never have been allowed to be part of our crop cycles. Um, we're losing bees. I just r heard a thing, we're losing um, uh, bald eagles, bees, butterflies, bugs, worms, things that do re we need. We need or we don't eat. Um, so that's one thing I hope that we're, I don't know, what are we doing to, to Monsanto is huge. They can, they can afford to just pay people millions of dollars. They're, they're being sued right and left. I don't know if, you're, you're aware of that. I hope you're aware of that. 
Um, so that's one thing. And then another thing is the privatization of, so, of mental health that our governor let happen in the past two years. Okay, could, um, one question okay. at a time. So okay. do you want them to All respond right. to the Monsanto oh. one for okay. now? Yeah. Sure. And then you can get, you know, you can ask another one later okay. after everyone's had a All chance. Right. Thank you. When, when you talk about uh, your earthworms and your organic material in your, your soil, you know, a lot of people aren't going to want to hear about it because manure enriches that soil. It does not kill the earthworms. It does not kill a lot of the, the bacteria that's in the soil. When you use commercial fertilizers such as uh, uh, such as uh, anhydrous, anhydrous goes in and, and it kills a lot of that bacteria. In, in a lot of places, I've got people that are organic farmers wanting to know if I know someone that's got manure that they can put on their ground. And it's, it's kind of a, a uh, I didn't ask take. about manure, I asked about Roundup. Well, Roundup, I, you, you started talking about the worms and stuff. Roundup is not killing your, your worms and so forth in the soil. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, what he, about the bees and the butterflies and... So that process you spoke of in Cedar County where weeds grow up and then farmers kill it, that's called spring. It's called what? Spring. Weeds grow. Would you like me to finish? Okay, thank you. I listen to you. I'd like to appreciate it if you listen to me. Um, I'm very confused about why you think that's a bad process because in the spring, weeds sprout up. Thistles, multiflora rose, toxic plants that are carnivores. You can laugh all you want, but you're obviously very uninformed about agriculture. Because in Cedar County, I could list you off three to 400 people who are doing cover crops. So the fact that you didn't see one in your immediate neighborhood, maybe take a drive around the rest of the county because a ton of people are using it. And Representative Senator Kenny is exactly right. We should be encouraging the application of hog manure in the ground because it helps those earthworms that you're referring to. I didn't mention manure. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with spreading manure if it's spread out. That, I, I don't feel that you're really understanding what I'm saying about Likewise. the weeds. The weeds. Um, weeds why grow do you, in the spring. Why do you want to just spray the whole Do you have field? any idea what would happen if you didn't spray weeds? For the love of God, they would take why don't over. You? They would take over. They're, they're carnivorous. Multiflora rose takes a 10-foot pathway around them and murders all the stuff that you're talking about. Okay, could I suggest maybe that if you want to follow up Ugh. with any of the legislators, that you do that via their email. I'm sure they're available by email or after tonight or after today. And we'll just move on to the next question. Yeah, you know, I, I, just to get, I mean, thanks, thanks for the question. And there's no easy answer to this, right? But I do think that people are generally would like to see less pesticide use, right? Uh, more more birds, more butterflies, and the notion that, you know, Roundup's a pretty pervasive, it's used a lot, it's seen as a, maybe safer, but I think the, I think the recent, there's the verdict still out on it, right? I mean, and the people most associated, you know, the people closest to it are people in agriculture, and what's their exposure, and making sure they're healthy. But I think there's a general concern, uh, you know, in the world about trying to have safer chemicals, uh, use them only when you need them, right? And and I think that's what we're getting a little bit of that here today. So I think we, you know, just to uh, affirm what you're saying, I think everybody in this room's concerned about it, um, and it's just an issue. We're gonna, you know, it's it's okay to raise the issue you've raised this morning. Well, so I, thanks I for didn't being hear here. anybody mention Roundup or Monsanto yeah. and any of yeah. the crops. So I just feel like it needs to be out there yeah. because it's a big, big business, and it's hard to. They're everywhere. <laughs> Thank you. And they're owned by a pharmaceutical company. Thank you for your passion. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bill Waldy with rural Iowa City resident, Newport Township. How's that? Can you hear me now? Uh, I just want to encourage you to keep pushing on I will at the three eight cents and the way it was passed ten years ago. We need more money, not less. Prime example is Kent Park Lake, $3 million partnership with the DNR. We clean it up. It's great now. Johnson County is also working on a wetland up by Sutliff, which will help with flooding and also nitrates. We need more. One request I have is on I will when it's passed, 
In 2008, different watershed management authorities were set up to help with flooding and do education, working closely with the uh, landowners. One challenge with WMAs is you've got 30 people in a room from different entities, and you need someone to help coordinate all the efforts, and that is an administrator, and that costs money. And if part of I will could be used, say, for the first five years, a cost share to help pay for that administrator so the, uh, the WMA can get up and going, I think that would be very helpful. Great suggestion. We have, what, 25 watershed management authorities approximately? Yeah, they keep growing, yeah. 30, 30. And uh, we need to provide some base funding if we're going to have well, them be successful. Mostly for the administrator. Absolutely. It's, it's tough Absolutely. to get people to put yeah. money in right away. Great suggestion. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Sylvia Casada, and I'm a, a resident of Johnson County. <laughs> I want to thank you very much for your service. It's a lot of work dedication and sometimes a lot of headaches and uh, no potty breaks, so I appreciate that from you all. Um, the reason I'm here today is I want to keep Iowa open for business, and that's small businesses. I'm a small business attorney, formerly working for very large national um, corporations, some of which are on the utility side and on the insurance side, but now I'm focusing on small people, folks who um, have a job and they were ready to leave it and they want to jump into you know, selling something to a municipality, a county, or a government. But it's very concerning to me that in the past five years, uh, Iowa has had more problems with being transparent about how contracts are being awarded at the state level, at the county level, and even, even the municipality level. So I want to ask you and urge you to consider making sure that Iowa's business lights are green and open and making it a fair level playing field for all businesses, including small ones, um, by improving our transparency chapter in the code. Right now, the IPIB, which is your, the uh, quasi-independent government agency that helps uh, citizens and attorneys obtain inf public information about their government, is seriously underfunded, and it is um, strangled by the language in the chapters. Right now, um, Transparency International scored Iowa with a D-plus for transparency. We are missing on key things that would help make Iowa a spectacular, transparent, open for business so that our small businesses can come here with confidence that they can open up. They don't need to pay uh, some backdoor price for getting to know somebody having special connections. Iowa is a fair dealer. And if you got a good product that should sell, it should. And by golly, that HR contract for $50 million should have been uh, available to the amazing coders that you have here in the technology corridor. And why it was outsourced to a shadowy, shady Texas company with a little bit of a reputation, I don't know. And I can tell you that some of the small entrepreneurs that are Iowans are going to be deeply discouraged when I go back and I report, hey, were you even aware of this? And their, their answer? because they can't afford lobbyists, they can barely afford me, they're gonna say, no, I didn't know, and I'm really PO'd. So thank you if you can make a change on that and address what your initial comments uh, to looking into this would be, because I, it, the, we're in 2020, another decade of amazing progress so do you have a question ahead of us. That is my question. Okay, thank What's, you. Thank, thank you. you. I think we, Sylvia, I think we'd all uh, appreciate any specific examples you have that you've come upon that are discouraging uh, small businesses from working on behalf of state and local governments. We'd, we'd like to have maybe some more ideas about what you think we need to change. Yeah, I'd, I'd be wide open. I mean, in state government, we've done bills for whistleblowers. We've done bills with the Public Information Board, with the ombudsman. Any suggestions you have, I'm all ears. So, okay. Sylvia, when we asked that question of the IT director on that no-bid contract, the comment was, well, the Iowa Department of Transportation and Iowa State had had this company, and therefore we should all adopt that and we should just go along with it. And it was a very poor answer to a question that says, why did you do this? It's clearly not something that we support and that we should legislatively allow. Um, and those were the comments that we got back. Well, we, they'd already tested this. It was already uh, piloted at the IDOT and, and Iowa State. And it's like, that's not a good enough answer, and it should never be. Sylvia, did you stop by this week? I keep thinking that maybe I missed you and you had information on this. If there is language, in about transparency that is not working and you have language maybe suggestions <coughs> uh, I, I missed it so would you please send it again 
Okay, I, I think somebody else stopped by on this subject too, and I had worked on um, when the creation of the Iowa Public Information Board, and it's been in place for a long time. I, I don't expect necessarily the things that we did then to continue working because one we have more technology we have more ways to communicate we have more ways to get information out so if there are things that are not working I would appreciate knowing about it so we can fix it okay thank you all right so first off just thank you to League of Women Voters for the event thank you to the state leadership here for your uh, bipartisan efforts uh, I think it goes a long way setting an example in the state of Iowa my name is Mark Ogden I'm a citizen farmer have to make a living off the farm in the solar industry as well. Um, fifth generation, I'm only here in Iowa because our family got run off the uh, farm in the town of Gettysburg at the time of the Civil War. And uh, the seventh generation uh, is due in our family uh, March 4th. So I've got a deep passion uh, wow. for agriculture. <laughs> and uh, in, in creating a legacy, we'll have a century farm in the year 2107. That's my goal, I won't be there to live to see it. But a young farmer is important, I think, to the vitality of our society, in our country, and uh, in, in the leadership in this nation. So the work that's uh, gone on in that, actually I want to call out, I think there's a lot of young farmers uh, that are conservationists actually making their life as farmers in this room. So I, I just want to applaud them for being here. But uh, most importantly, we also a volunteer that work hard <coughs> at the local level, making sure that young farmers and that our, our government processes and the, you know, the, the regulations, all that are supportive of continuing agriculture forward by working and learning to use your words, uh, Senator Kinney, uh, every single day. So I know we've got uh, Representative Kaufman, you put forth uh, House Study Bill 632 related to zoning, uh, plug, you know the bipartisan efforts to do that. And then um, we've also got what I'm calling the young farmer, heard referred to as a young farmer bill uh, House Study Bill 650 and Senate Study Bill 3183. Uh, the work that's going on that you guys you know, clearly recognize that that's needed and I uh, just want your comments on the status. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Mark, and I appreciate the very large presence of farmers that are living examples in this room that conservation is a good thing and that we're taking initiative to offer that up voluntarily. The ordinance that the Johnson County Board of Supervisors passed did go from really bad to bad. And so I appreciate <clears throat> those efforts. But that's not a victory to go from really bad to bad. The ordinance is still illegal. You don't get to regulate the number of livestock on a farm. Whether you disagree with that, that's a different conversation. State law says you don't get to do that. And the ordinance does that. You don't get to require permission slips to be able to put up certain buildings. The, regulate, the, the ordinance does that. You don't get to charge $250 to have a damn potluck, which is what the ordinance does. It's a bad ordinance. Might be popular in the urban areas, but in rural Johnson County, I think that Congress and Fidel Castro actually have higher approval ratings than the UDO. And so that is why I'm putting forth the bill. Now, Representative Masher will talk about a problem that absolutely exists. You have people going out that have good jobs outside of agriculture. We'll just say doctors, lawyers, et cetera. And they buy a heifer <clears throat> and they say, I'm a farmer. And they try to take advantage of all of the benefits that being a farmer does for your land. And I am all ears on how to prevent those people from falsely pre presenting themselves as farmers. But that's not what the ordinance does. The ordinance has a pathway to do that that also brings punishments to good actors, good farmers, and young farmers that want to get into the industry. So I, I appreciate some of the efforts, but the ordinance is not legal. There are good things in it that I would like to see go forward, but don't be fooled at all on the intent of the three supervisors, not the two that recently came on, but the other three, what their overall intent is. Just look at Facebook. Look at the anti-agriculture spew that comes from three of our Board of Supervisors. That's the real intent of the UDO. So, so, so Mark, I know you were at some of the hearings and I know some of the other farmers in the room were, were at those hearings as well. Um, they were the planning and zoning hearings 
and those were held, um, there were a number of those three, I think, and then there were also hearings throughout the county at the local level in Lone Tree in some of those rural areas to get, again, farmer input. So what I will say to you is you made a difference. The system worked in light of the fact that there were 13 recommendations from planning and zoning, and all 13 of those came from you, and they were adopted by the supervisors. So to say that, you know, these are de to demonize supervisors who were listening and trying to do the best they could to reflect. One supervisor never showed up to any of those I, I'm well aware of that. But I'm just telling you that a number did, and I, I know there were other legislators who did as well. I know Senator Kennedy Kinney was there as well. So I think, is it perfect? No. And we've already passed one of the bills for the young farmers to address the potluck issue. And I know that what we're trying to figure out is how do you get to the bad actors? You don't want them either. And I know that. And so if we can come to some kind of a resolution on that, I think that's a good thing because I don't want them either. And I think the county is trying to figure out how do we deal with that? And if we can find a common ground there, then I think we can find a solution to this issue. But to demonize the, the supervisors and to say the process didn't work and it's still a bad bill is not helpful. It's not helpful to anybody. So work with us and let's figure out what needs to be done to address those that don't deserve that. I don't want people building in floodplains, neither do you. I don't want people building on land that shouldn't be built on, neither do you. I don't want people getting those zoning advantages when they have five head of cattle, neither do you. And farming isn't their primary occupation. So work with us, figure out how to do that work with the supervisors. I know they came a long way, and it was because of what you did and the fact that you were there. I was there. I know that Representative Kaufman lives in Cedar County, but he didn't come to any of those meetings. I watched and saw the effect you had. And so I don't want to discount that at all, and I don't want to discount the efforts that the supervisors were trying to make. So thank you, and I hope we can find some resolution. I think your question was you wanted an update on House Study Bill 632 and House Study Bill 650, right? Okay, so they both passed committee. I'm not sure about the Senate one, but there's the answer to the question that you asked. Thoughts, <laughs> Thoughts on those? Um, I don't like taking away local control as a general rule, um, but the 630, I think 632 was that one, right? What was, no, 650 was the farm bill, right? Yeah. Okay. I think I voted for both of them out. Um, the young farmers bill, um, you know, it was a, it was a good bill. It needed to get done. Um, it's it's it did, it did create inequities in the counties, right? And then I think 632. Um, it is the um, zoning one, right? Okay. Um, it, yeah, it was just something that needed to be to be done because you can't have some counties doing one thing and other counties doing another. And, and um, so, yeah, I think I'm pretty sure I voted for both of those out of committee. Thank you very much. In, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. In this, I just want people to realize I don't think we're taking local control away because it wasn't theirs to take away because the state has control of it. And, and that's... Well, that's that's where I was coming. Yeah, I, I mean, this is a complicated issue. I, I served on the county board here for six years in the '90s, when there was a hell of a lot of every every month we had 20 zoning applications, and the policy of the board for for a very long time was let's keep suburban development and these one-off <coughs> McMansions out of the hair of ag neighborhoods, right? So we encouraged growth in the North Corridor. That was kind of that also had its own problems and controversies. All right, so now the, the need for a, a, a new farmer to be able to get on the land, 40 acres is a bar, is is too high a bar. So we're going to say now that goes away. That's I think that makes sense. The challenge before this board is going to be the person that rolls in here from Boston, has a big pot of cash finds would love to be out in the country 
the board being able to say to that person who's, who's arrived, uh, no. Because I do think there's value in keeping urban folks who don't know a darn thing about farming out of the, out of the backyards of people that are involved in production agriculture. They don't understand animals. They don't understand dust. They don't understand odor, right? And I think the board has done a really good job up to this point trying to minimize the conflicts. And so for, I think for every, every new farmer, that you're going to have an application from somebody that might want to be in your neighborhood that you're not going to want in your neighborhood. So the, I think that, that balance is trying, and, and, and Representative Kaufman alluded to it, but what, is, what are the details around that, okay? Because my guess is you, there's some unintended consequences here that people that want to farm freely and keep doing what they do are going are gonna to be in the boardroom asking questions about why, is so, why did you let so-and-so do what you did here? Okay, thank you. I think we'll move forward. We actually have time for one more question um, unless the legislators were, are open to keep going. taking the three yeah. that are in line okay. after her. Is that okay? Yep. All right, great. Good thank you. Good morning. Um, first of all, I'm Leslie Carpenter and I'm an advocate for people with serious brain disorders. I'd like to thank you all for the work that you do every day. Um, for me, just keeping up with all the bills that are dropped every day and looking out for the ones that affect people with mental illnesses feels like a full-time job. So I can't imagine what it's like for you with all the bills that you have to review and read and see all the good and bad parts of them. Um, much of this week was spent for me advocating against SSB 3158. It was the work requirements reporting bill um, that could do a lot of harm to people with evolving mental illnesses as well as poor people as well as single mothers who can only work a minimum wage job. Um, unfortunately, I was unsuccessful in killing that bill. We were able to get a couple of amendments added to the bill from Republican senators, and I was grateful for that. My question is to you, um, Representative Kaufman, you may not be aware of this bill even, um, but I'm wondering if we might be able to have a conversation about that, because last year there was no taste for it in the House, and I'm hoping that that will be the case again this year. Could you meet that number again? Yes, SSB 3158. I am not familiar, but if you want to contact me probably Tuesday, give me money to familiarize myself with it, then I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, sir. Thank you for bringing that up, Leslie, because uh, I, I actually was a Promise Jobs Welfare Reform Supervisor for 12 years. I know the population of people that we're talking about. There already is a work and or a school requirement for people receiving aid. And quite frankly, if we're going to come up with a work requirement, then we should make it across the board for anyone that receives any government money. So that's the way it should sit. So, but the people we're talking about are usually already working, working two or three jobs, or disabled and elderly and cannot work, and of course children. So we really need to know who we're talking about before we start talking work requirements. Thank you. Can we move forward? Are we okay? All right. Thank All right. you. Thank you. My name is Kerry Grunhagen. and I own a small business near Wilton. Iowa has some of the highest restrictions for occupational licensing laws in the U.S. Occupational licensing disproportionately affects minorities and low-income occupations that discourage growth and entrepreneurship. People who are licensed out of state are not always able to transfer it to Iowa. In order to attract people to the state of Iowa, <coughs> uplift those who are economically disadvantaged, and encourage entrepreneurship, would you support universal recognition of occupational licenses in the state of Iowa? Can you tell me which business you own, just out of curiosity? Uh, I'd rather not say. Okay, no, that's fair. I just, I, I, I live in rural Wilton, so yep. happy to support you. Um, we passed the occupational licensure bill with reciprocity in it out of the state government committee unanimously. So I agree with everything you said. Thank you. And, and that was the governor's bill, if you remember. Um, we didn't amend it or change it at all. It also allows individuals who have uh, been in prison the opportunity to be able to get licensure in plumbing, electrical work, you know, all of those trades occupations 
where they have a shortage and they need those workers. And so I think in many ways that goes a long way towards helping them. It also reduced for low income people who are trying to get those licensure uh, pieces, it, they don't have to pay the fees. And that was another stumbling block in terms of their ability to be able to get those licenses. So we've been really trying to move the ball forward and uh, doing some good things uh, for those individuals who are looking to uh, get some of that reciprocity from other states and provide more of an avenue for them to be able to work in Iowa. Okay. Thank you. Yep. I'm John Mathias. I lead the Iowa City Athletic Officials Association about 320 local referees and umpires in the sports of football, basketball, baseball, and softball. And uh, uh, officials are becoming an, an endangered species, especially here in Iowa. There are about half as many today as when I first started about 25 years ago. And part of the, prob part of the main problem is the behavior of adults at sporting events. <laughs> and it's, it's become uh, nearing a crisis moment and we've seen across the country and unfortunately here in Iowa several attacks on sports officials. Iowa is one of a minority of states that does not have additional laws protecting sports officials and um, I, I want to thank Representative Kaufman and Senator Bolcom for filing bills this year and I know that it stalled and, um, and thank you for putting me in touch with Representative Moore. He's the only person I've ever talked to from the who's been an official who is not supportive of this kind of legislation. I was wondering what, the, what are the prospects of moving this forward next year and can we get some actual current officials in to talk about why the, what they're experiencing and why this might be necessary. Yeah, John, I, I, in my wildest dreams, I never dreamed the one official on my committee wouldn't be on board with the official language. So that was a, yeah. blew my yeah. mind. He, he actually said that he'd prefer to, if it was up to him, he'd remove the protections for fire department, nurses, and stuff that's already in the law. So I think if it makes you feel better, yeah. I challenged him to a wrestling match in the well this week, <laughs> when, when, or Thursday when the state wrestling turns. <laughs> I will not stop until we get this done. I am an official myself on a volunteer capacity in the softball world, far different from your world, but still I understand the world and I will keep working to make it happen. We have Representative Eisenhart on our Democrat that's uh, official for many sports too. Okay. It'll have a new floor manager next year. All right. So, and, and sometimes things take a couple of years. Sure. We start over again next January, so we'll need to reintroduce and uh, reintroduce what the, 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 the bill again. But and we good. can bring any number of officials yeah. into to yeah. Des Moines to talk about it. Well, that, but <laughs> and, and, and it's good for officials to reach out at home mm -hmm. to their legislators. It's also really effective. Sit down, have a cup of coffee, and walk through it. All right. John, but, it's pretty sad when we have to have law enforcement at high school games now yeah. to control adult behavior. Yeah. That's a pretty sad statement, isn't it? It is. It is. Thanks, for, thanks Thank for your you. work on this. Thank you. And John, just real quick, the best advice I can give you is exactly, I want to go on the record and say I totally agree with Senator Bolcom. Um, <laughs> having, no, Joe and I agree a lot, we just love to fight. <laughs> having officials in your orbit contact our legislators between now and January to set up the inevitability of it would be a very helpful. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Hi. I'm John McAtee, and I'm a volunteer with Citizens Climate Lobby. Just wanted to thank all of you for being here. I feel like we're in league together. Um, Iowans trying to solve some really tough and complex problems. Uh, so uh, Citizens Climate Lobby, we're trying to pass a bipartisan climate solution bill in the U.S. Congress, the Energy Innovation Act, and that will reduce carbon emissions 40% in 12 years, create 2.1 million jobs, a lot of them in Iowa, by accelerating the shift from fossil fuels to green renewable energy. And in brief, this partisan climate solution bill will put a price on carbon, puts an increasing cost on fossil fuels, so, and that ener the energy companies will have to pay at the source, like the wellhead. So all of this revenue will come from the carbon fee will be given back to citizens, and they can spend it in any way they want. And that makes it equitable for poor people and they can spend it, uh, that will all be spent to support their local economy. So uh, I think that this would be uh, a great bill to uh, reduce the severity of weather, the flooding and droughts that we're all gonna be experiencing. I mean, climate change is gonna be really hitting us all very hard in this um, coming years economically also. Uh, so I just wanted to ask if all of you are aware of this bipartisan climate solution bill 
and would you encourage our members of Congress to support it? Yes. So, yes. I, I learned about it in our caucus <laughs> and uh, voted to make it part of our plan. Thank you. Yeah, I'm on the uh, uh, platform committee and I'm making sure it's on there too. Yes. Does it have a number? Yeah, HR 763 in the House, Energy Innovation Act. And I can give you information about it later. Uh, by the way, the uh, city of Iowa City just endorsed it and the Johnson County uh, Board of Supervisors, which is really significant. Would you send it my way? I'm not familiar. I'm happy to take a look at it. Say it again? Would you be able to send me an electronic copy? Yes, definitely. Okay, because I'm not familiar. I'm happy to look at it. Yeah. And we just want to make sure it's equitable for poor people because <coughs> if you raise the cost of um, energy, uh, you know, Exxon and other companies are going to pass that gradually down to consumers, but the carbon dividend would make it equitable. And the last thing is that it's revenue neutral, it means it doesn't grow government and doesn't raise taxes. And uh, that makes it acceptable across the political spectrum because conservatives and Republicans just don't want to raise taxes. A lot of us feel that way. So anyway, just wanted to make sure you knew about that. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Thanks to all of you, those with questions and those with responses for an informative session. Thanks also to our co-sponsors, 100 Grannies, the Iowa City Area Group of the Sierra Club, the Iowa City Climate Advocates, and CAFE, and to the local television staff for filming this event and live streaming it on the League's Facebook page. Rebroadcasts of this forum will be run on Iowa City Channel 4, Coral Vision, and North Liberty TV. See their respective websites for programming. We also appreciate the use of the Coralville City Hall. Our next forum will be March 28th from 9.30 to 11.30 at the North Liberty City Hall. Please join us. Thank you.